I find it ironic that I'm going to mention the tin man this morning in the service. If you were wondering where I got the idea for the line, if, you only had, if I only had a heart, it's from the Wizard of Oz movie, and the tin man will be a character in the sermon. And you know, the tin man is rusty, and he needs oil, and then once he gets going, he is moving okay until something happens and he stiffens up, especially rain as happens again in another scene in the movie. Well, I am walking around today and I have not sat down through worship because I pulled something in my back this morning and I didn't want to sit down and then to have to get up because I stiffen up when I sit down. So I'm just am standing up and moving and I feel like saying, oil. Oh. <laughs> so one of the things that I do as a teacher and I don't even remember when I started this. I've been doing it for years. But I am very interactive with my class. I don't think that will surprise any of you. I'm very engaged with them. I teach with a lot of energy. And I like to make it fun and enjoyable and participatory for them. And so when we're doing things where we have, I ask for answers. It may be to how you spell something or a math problem or an answer to some question I've asked about which one of these is a noun that names a thing, any kind of question that I might do, I got in the habit of when a wrong answer appeared, say, on the board, I would go cross it out and I would go, eh, thanks for playing anyway. And so now my kids will do it. So when I X out an answer or I say, they'll go like this. So here's what I want you to do. When I point, I want you to go, eh, thanks for playing anyway. So that's what I'm used to getting from my kids in school. So let's practice it. Ready? Yeah. Welcome to first grade in Mr. Gates class. So, they especially love it when there's a raised hand, and I didn't teach them to do this, they just started doing this on their own. I'm asking a question, and the kid will raise their hand, and I'll call on them, and they like, Mr. Gates, can I go fill my water bottle? And the class will go, eh, thanks for playing anyway. So what does all that have to do with this? Well, let me ask you this. How many of you would say that we are saved by faith and grace and not what we do? Anybody? Raise your hand if you think that would be a very proper response. Well, you are in great company because the disciple, the apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, would agree with you. Paul said we are saved by faith and not by the works of the law. We are saved by faith alone. You would also have great company with Martin Luther, the beginner of the Protestant Reformation and the founder of what became the Lutheran Church. He said, we are saved by faith alone. He believed that very firmly. And he would be horrified 
that we were in the book of James this morning because he detested the book of James. One biographer of his said that he would have thrown the book of James out of the New Testament if he would have been able to. He called it an epistle of straw. Now, that is terminology that's a little lost on us now, but it meant that Martin Luther thought it was not much of substance at all. And what he disagreed with was what he felt were leanings towards being saved by your works. And the way that James talks in his letter and the things that he says came a little too close for Martin Luther's comfort to works righteousness and that we are redeemed by what we do and not by grace. And so Martin Luther was not a fan of the book of James. What is James going on about? Because this talk of works, deeds, in the New International Version, also called works in other versions, meaning what we do. James wants to get it across to us that that is very, very important. What we do is a key part of your faith. In fact, he goes so far as to say, faith without deeds, faith without works is dead. So what does James mean? James is suggesting that our faith must be a part of our life. It must be something that we live with all our heart. We can't just say we believe and that does it. You have to live your faith in order for it to really be following Christ. You have to live with all your heart. And that is what takes us to the Wizard of Oz and the Tin Man. So there is a scene in The Wizard of Oz at the very end of the movie. And if you recall the story of The Wizard of Oz, what the tin man is lacking is a heart. And he wants a heart to make him whole. And so he goes on the journey with, at that time, Dorothy, and the scarecrow, and then later joined by the cowardly lion to go see the Wizard of Oz to get a heart. And at the end of the movie, after they have triumphed over the Wicked Witch of the West and they are back before the wizard, the wizard gives him this token of a heart. He calls it a testimonial. All right, so you, are you ready with this? Okay. And the wizard says to the tin man, what matters if you have a heart, how you really are judged is by how much you are loved by others. It's not how much you love, but how much you are loved by others. Thanks for playing anyway. Because, and I risk the wrath of Wizard of Oz fans worldwide, the wizard is wrong. The wizard is wrong. 
It's not how much that we are loved, but how much we love others. Show me in the scriptures where Jesus says, I want to be the object of everybody's worship. I want to be served because I am king. And tell me how much you love me. Come on, bring it on, bring it on. Is that Jesus in any shape, form, or fashion? No. And if somebody raised their hand and said yes, then we would have to go, and eh, thanks for playing anyway. Because the Christian life is about loving one another. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So if that's where you're going with this, if you're saying to yourself, it's what we do with our heart to love others that matters. And so what we do really does matter. You see where I'm going with this? That what we do really does matter? You've got excellent company. You've got the author of James, and you have Jesus himself. You remember in Matthew 25? You're going, Matthew 25, oh yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm going to my um, absolute complete recall of my brain and accessing that. So well, so I'll save you the trouble of having to pull that out real quick. Let me remind you. Jesus says, and I, I probably have to say, I think this may be my favorite story in the scriptures. Jesus has separated the sheep from the goats. And he says to the sheep, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was in need and you saw to the needs of my life. Now, is that somebody just sitting around and saying, oh, yes, Jesus, I believe. Yes, Jesus, I believe. Or is that somebody's faith in action? That's somebody's faith in action. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 25. And then Jesus When the people say, when did we see you like that, Jesus? You know what Jesus says? Remember that? When you did it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. And there's this problem going on in the time of James where people would think that just saying they believed was enough. And there's this illustration that James gives in the story this morning where apparently there are people who just sit there and say, I believe, I believe, and they may put some money in the collection plate, they may show up on Sundays and think they are doing pretty well. They talk about Jesus, and worship and with their friends and they're trying to live a nice life and they do those little things but apparently there are people who think they're doing that well who say they believe who see somebody in need physical needs of life 
And go up to that person and say, I hope you find something to eat and something to drink soon. I will keep you in my prayers. And think they have done enough. It's somebody else's responsibility. They have acknowledged the need of that person and are keeping them in their prayers, but not anything else. And James says there is a profound difference between people who say, I believe, and think that's all there is to it, basically. There's a difference between that kind of faith and a faith that is in action. And so James says, I will show you my faith by my deeds. In the Middle Ages, there were troops of actors who went to all different kinds of places And they performed ballads and songs and plays. One of the plays that was popular, or one of the types of plays, was a morality play. And the morality plays showed the tension of the good and the bad within all of us and the conflict that that produces. And one of the most popular of the morality plays was called Everyman. And every man was the character representing all of us. And every man is summoned before God to make an accounting of his life. And every man says to death who has come for him, come back tomorrow so I can be prepared. And death says, I will be back later today, for today is the day. Make what preparations you can. And so every man goes to his family and friends and asks if they will speak for him. And they refuse. And then he turns to his possessions. And possessions refuses him. He turns to beauty. And beauty turns him down. He turns to intelligence. And intelligence turns him down. And strength. Strength. Surely strength will stand strongly with me. And strength turns him down. Every which way he turns, he is turned down. And he is dejected. Because there is... No one, he thinks, that is going to speak for him. And then to his surprise, he discovers that good deeds still stands with him. And good deeds says, I will speak for thee, every man. I will speak for thee. And the lesson to be learned is that it's not the things we accumulate that we can take with us. None of that goes with us, but only what we have done with our life. James is making this contrast between a faith that's just basically words, well-intentioned, but isn't really doing anything to live like Christ would live. And it's a sad thing, really. I think that so many people have kind of looked at James in this way. For James is not really saying we are saved by what we do. James is contrasting 
a faith that is really dead and a faith that is alive, a faith that lives with heart. Where is your heart leading you? How is your faith lived? Inquiring people. Remember that inquiring minds want to know? How is your faith lived? Inquiring people want to know. Like James and like Jesus, and like all the least of these, my brothers and sisters, amen.